book talk begins at 15 minutes and 34 seconds. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 650, In Memoriam. This week, we would like to thank our patrons Jennifer L., Sarah Blake, Kathy Sharp, Kim Kilborough, Lisa B., and new patrons Jessa and Renee H. Thank you so much for your support of the show. Could not do this without you. Well, hello. How are you? I'm okay. And I'm going to take that as a win. Last week really flattened me, so I'm hoping I'm hoping recording today isn't going to knock me out for another two days. But it might, because there's a lot here at the beginning of Emma. But before we get to Emma, first the raffle. We are raffling off a lovely little set of handmade, hand-stitched, and beautifully completed uh, coasters, and there are two little bookmarks in here. I know I showed last week on YouTube, and we'll put pictures of these in the show notes as well. There's a close-up of one. Let's see. There you go. But on the back, it has text from our books. I love that. Susan just does awesome work. If you haven't done a raffle copter raffle with us before, the only thing you need to know is that, is there anything you need to know? Yes. The only thing you need to know is that when you go to join the raffle, it will give you uh, several options of things to do to enter the raffle. So, for instance, it could be like, tell a friend about Craplet. And you click, yeah, I did that. And, you know, make sure you do. And then um, that will be an entry into the raffle. I think we limit it to one entry per person. There are other things too, you know, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on iTunes, leave a review, stuff like that. So, it doesn't cost anything to enter the raffle. And at the end of April, I will be sending out two, two winners worth of the coaster bookmark sets. So thank you, Susan, again, for your some work. I am so excited. Now, you may be <laughs> worried because I called today's episode in memoriam. Let me tell you, back in 2006, when we first started this podcast, we were so entirely reliant on LibriVox and the amazing people who volunteer to be LibriVox readers. And, you know, in the way of you get what you pay for, it's free audio and sometimes it's great and sometimes not so much. And in the early days, I didn't have anywhere to fall back on. So we had to use whatever recordings we could get. One of the people who recorded an awful lot back then and who you could always rely on to do a really solid job was Kay Ray. I can't even count how many different texts I have her voice lodged in my head with. I found this out in December when I was recording the 12 Days of Craftlet. I didn't bring it up then, and I didn't want to bring it up during the end of The Three Musketeers, but I thought today is a good day to announce that K. Ray died suddenly last summer. I don't know if you pay attention to these things or or not. I was certainly shocked. It happened, I found out because I was on LibriVox looking up stories to do, found one that she had done, and, you know, it lists the names of the readers, and K. Ray had a birth date and a death date next to her name. And I was floored, so I went down that rabbit hole. It was a surprise. It's horrible. She was young. She was full of beans. 
and life. And and I will miss getting to hear new recordings of her voice. They they are still her old recordings are still on LibriVox. But yeah, I thought it was important for us to mark her passing. Uh, what with us coming up on our what 18th year anniversary, and also because. Graflet relies so much on you and the other people that we talk to and work with who love books. Having someone that young pass who loved literature as much as, as she did, it really hit me hard. And not just because, you know, oh, we're getting older. Whoa, whoa. This hit somewhere harder. And I mentioned last week that with all of the things that I'm learning about Jane Austen, all of the research that's been done since we did Persuasion, or at least it's not that it's been done, it's it's been released. And I, I honestly think, and I'm not trying to be radical here, I actually think a reason why a lot of this research is so revelatory is because it takes a while for the the people who have control of the canon and the kind of lit crit microphone it takes a while for them to expand, to include other voices, women, people of color. There are things that are being researched about Jane Austen books now that just nobody thought to think about. And it's, I think, because previously, up until the 70s, is that right? Yeah, I think up until the 70s, nobody was writing seriously about Jane Austen except for men, which is marvelous. I mean, when you think of all the female writers over time who've been completely forgotten, regionalist writers and, you know, I'm not complaining. But I do think it's interesting. And it's not the only place in the world where I've noticed like, oh, I bet that's because women are in there wrestling up some thoughts. But that led me to thinking about 2006 and Pride and Prejudice. And I mentioned last week that I wanted to redo Pride and Prejudice. And I'm still figuring out how to do that. I don't want to lose those original episodes. They're kind of funky time capsules now, for one thing. I mean, my kids are growing up, and you may be able to hear one of them in the background every once in a while laugh. And the kid just has enormous, joyous guffaw. So it doesn't matter where I am in the house, I will hear them laugh. But they're time capsules of the crafting websites and the people who were podcasting at the time. And I don't want to lose that. But I also do want to find a way to expand the commentary on Pride and Prejudice. Certainly, if you have any ideas of how you would like this to look when Eric and I redo this, please let us know. You can write to heather at craftlit.com or eric, E-R-I-K, at craftlit.com. Or you can call 206-350-1642 and leave us a voicemail. And I would like to specifically ask the people who have been listening since 2006. You didn't have to start with Pride and Prejudice. I'm just the first calendar year, April 2006 to April 2007. If you started listening in that first year, and you would be interesting in hopping on a Zoom call with me or doing an audio recording or voicemail, I would love to be able to chat with you, maybe a group of you, about the early books. This would be a book-specific conversation and a craftlet in general conversation. It's something that I think would make revisiting Pride and Prejudice very special for me, and I hope very special for uh, everybody who's listening. So if you are interested, you can, again, call. 206-350-1642 and let us know, hi, it's me, I'm interested, here's my email or here's my phone number, text me. Or if you email us to say, hey, I'm in, please write OG2006 listener. How about that? Um, and that way we'll be able to tell from the, the subject lines uh, what we're looking at and correlate all the data. And then we'll get back to people because we got to figure out when and how and all that stuff. So along with thinking about the genesis of Craftlet so long ago, I 
also have been thinking about what we used to do back in the day that I would like to start doing again. And I don't need your help this week or probably next week, but I might need your help after that. And what I'm talking about is promos. When podcasters were new and RSS feeds were the only way you were going to really listen to one, I mean, there was iTunes, but not everybody could use it. Not everybody had an iPod. A lot of people had MP3 players, but anyway, I feel like, and we used to walk uphill both ways to school. Anyway, thinking about promos made me think about some of the podcasts that are still going as well. And the first one you're going to hear from, a promo today, you're going to hear from one of our readers. She appeared as Armina Harker in Dracula. She was, she's been a fantastic book reader professionally, and she's just awesome. Ariel Lipshaw, she and her husband have been doing a podcast for quite a while now. They've covered a lot of books that we've done on Craftlet, and I'll share links with you for episodes of theirs that deal with books that we've done on Craftlet so that you can, you know, correlate. But Adapt or Perish is the name of the podcast, and here is their promo. Adapt or Perish is a show about adaptation, whether stage to screen, book to television, comic to blockbuster, or movie to musical and back again. Today we are talking about Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Howard's End, Super Mario Brothers, Hamlet, Emma, Tarzan of the Apes. I'm Jeremy, and you can join me and my co-hosts, Ari and Ian, as we follow the stories we all love through years of remakes and revivals to figure out which ones work, which ones don't, and why. Find us at adapterparishcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. So adapt or perish. It's a sterling listen. Like I have never heard a bad adapt or perish episode. And I'm not just saying that because Ariel was our Mina Harker. I'd say it no matter what. Because it's true. And another couple of people who I would want to give a shout out to, who have been doing this since 2011, are the History Chicks, who are in the Craftlet group on Facebook, stealthily. So I'm getting a promo from them soon. But in the meantime, I am going to link you out to an NPR interview that they did with their local NPR affiliate in Kansas City. And it's lovely. It's charming. And you'll get to hear a little bit of the behind the scenes that we never really see. It's lovely. And I just wanted to give them a, a shout out for that because that's just really cool. Anytime mainstream media covers a, a podcaster as opposed to a procaster, it just makes my day. So could not happen to more lovely people. All right. I am also putting a note in the show notes about a version of Emma that is crazy expensive on Audible. And I had no credits left because somebody keeps stealing my credits. And I, I wasn't going to pay $28 and change US to get this particular version of Emma, but I knew it would still be worth it. So if I could find it somewhere else, I would. Our library does not carry this particular version, but for now, it's been up for a year. I'm sure it will get taken down at some point. There is this particular recording of Emma available on YouTube. It's two files, one 10-hour file and one six-hour file and change. It's the version that one of our listeners noted to me has, was read by Juliet Stevenson. And I don't know if you've listened to Juliet Stevenson of Truly Mad Madly Deeply from way back in the day. I don't know if you've heard her do audiobook reading before. She is superb. I mean, does not miss a beat. Clearly has gone through the book with highlighters like it's a script. She never fumbles who is speaking, and she's always very clear in her vocal choices. So it's there for now. I don't know, maybe you can download it or use a screen recorder to record it or whatever. It's 
I don't really like supporting things that are breaking copyright laws, but gosh darn it, 28 bucks and change. Oh no. And you know it's not all going to Juliet Stevenson. Grr. Anyway, I did want to let you know about that. I'm very excited. I have been listening to it. It is marvelous. And Eric and I will do the same thing that we did during The Three Musketeers. If you want to listen to another version, whether it's Juliet Stevenson or somebody else, we will be posting a time code right before we go into the chapter audio so that you know when to pause and where to fast forward to. All right. <sighs> Emma, we're going to do chapters one through three today. It's going to be a big episode, but so much important exposition happens in this set of chapters. And I know I'm going to wind up having to come back and reset some of these things because I'm just not going to be able to get to everything today. So there will, there will be times when I'll be like, so back in chapter one, one of the things that I needed to have said was, and that's, that's why. So Emma, as a book and as a movie, I really wanted to thank everybody who responded to our little poll as to whether you'd read it and loved it, read it and meh, hadn't read it at all. We're almost evenly distributed among those three positions when it comes to Emma. And I'm hoping that I can bring all of the listeners who think Emma's kind of meh along with us happily and joyously, and also give the people who've never read it uh, a real good first read. I'm kind of jealous that you get to read it for the first time. The first time that I read Emma, boy, this is dating me, I was reading it as I was riding the subway to my teaching job, reading it on a handspring visor, not a Palm Pilot. Oh, no, no, no. I had a handspring visor. It had color. It was also the only reason why I had my attendance records after 9-11 because when we evacuated, everybody else left their grade books and their attendance records in the classroom. My records were on my handspring visor. I'm just saying. And the guy who made the app that I used for grading, he used to use my story as an advertisement for his app, which just made me happy because he's a lovely guy. Anyway, more people than not have seen some movie or TV version of Emma. And this includes Clueless, which is a fine and fabulous and fun movie. I just rewatched it again. And aside from the fact that Paul Rudd had, does not change, he's like Dick Clark was. The man never ages. Aside from that, it's a, it's a bit of a time capsule movie now. It's still fun. But the important thing about the film adaptations and the uh, BBC adaptations, the one with Kate Beckinsale, big one that hit with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Jeremy Northam, and then the, the more recent Anya Taylor-Joy, Emma, from what was it, 2020, 2021, something like that? It was during lockdowns, I think, was when it came out, right? Anyway, I want you to forget all of the casting. I mean this so, so sincerely. In these first three chapters, we hear from our narrator, our third person, kind of the voice of Jane Austen, but really a kind of dispassionate narrator. We hear about the, the town, the estates, the people, and we hear very specific attributes for each person as a setup. Later in these same chapters, but also throughout the book, but later in these same chapters, we get little pieces of information that fine-tune that original picture that we got. So if somebody is described as being amiable and easy to get along with at the beginning, later you're going to hear, well, amiable, yes, but only in their own home. They don't like traveling to see anybody, but they're more than happy to, to send a carriage for you to, to bring you over to their place because it, it all has to be around about them. 
it's almost like you're uh don't judge a book by its cover with people that your first perception your first awareness or understanding of somebody is oh my gosh they're so lovely they're so wonderful those are fun and the longer you know them you're like and they're a little prickly there right so we are absolutely going to have that happen just in today's first three chapters but the reason why I bring up the get the movie casting out of your head is because the movie casting makes it look like there are certain givens. And I've made the joke about Emma not playing blonde. And it's true. The only description we actually have of Emma in the book is that she has hazel eyes. There are plenty of people who think that she's blonde because she praises Harriet for her beauty, and Harriet is blonde. I don't think that that's Emma stating, oh, I think she's pretty because she looks like me, which would be a perfectly reasonable thing to think of a vain person. But Emma, one of the only things that makes her redeemable in some of the chapters that we're going to read are that she truly isn't vain. And yet she is absolutely described as being beautiful. Not by the narrator, though. We're going to get to that. So I'm going to go over some context building, and then I'm going to go over some terms that are used strangely, and also, you know, terms that just have gone out of style. And then we'll listen to the chapter audio, and we'll talk after that. So the setup. Jane Austen was known for Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion and uh, Mansfield Park. Although her name didn't appear on the cover, it was, <clears throat> as I mentioned last week, it was like a not very well held secret. It wasn't like the Bronte sisters, that these were books written by Jane. So it turns out that one of her fans, who knew who she was, was the Prince Regent. And she was not thrilled with the behavior of the Prince Regent. So when she was in London at one point, she was requested to meet with the Prince Regent's secretary, a gentleman who, I'm not joking, mansplained how to write a book to her. Her response to him is spectacular. But uh, the first important part is she was asked to dedicate Emma to the Prince Regent. She spent like a month trying to come up with some way of doing this because it's not like you can say no. And and then wrote to this guy, the, the secretary, and said, uh, I don't know what the protocol is supposed to be on something like this. Can you help a girl out? That may have been part of the problem. This is what eventually was published. The dedication reads, To His Royal Highness the Prince Regent. This work is, by His Royal Highness's permission, most respectfully dedicated by His Royal Highness's dutiful and obedient humble servant, the author. I have never come across a more sorry excuse for dedication. Oh, I love her. And then this guy, James Stanier Clark, who was the assistant librarian secretary to the Prince Regent, told her, you know, how to write a book. And uh, Jane Austen wrote back to him from his comments that, like, you could include a a clergyman, somebody who's served their country well, blah, blah, blah. And she wrote back, I am quite honored by your thinking me capable of drawing such a clergyman as you have the sketch of in your note from November 16th. But I assure you, I am not. The comic part of the character I might be equal to, but not the good, the enthusiastic, the literary, and I think I may boast myself to be, with all possible vanity, the most unlearned and uninformed female who ever dared to be an authoress. I don't know if he felt the burn when he got that. He probably thought, oh, well, you know, it's good to find a woman who knows her place. I don't know, but wow. Mm. Jane Austen, man, she could. You don't want to be on the side of her that is looking askance because she's going to burn a hole in you. Okay, so we have three chapters today. 
the first chapter is our main core group of people around whom the plot revolves. The second chapter is the backstory to the most important person in Emma's life, uh, Miss Taylor, who gets married at the beginning of this book. And you find out the backstory of her husband, but also kind of the backstory of several people who are going to become very important. And then the third chapter today is giving you Highbury and kind of the the hierarchy of Highbury and how how everybody interacts and interrelates. We'll be making a family tree kind of flowcharty thing that we can put in the show notes because I don't think any of the information that I want to put in there will spoil things. Like with Tenant of Wildfell Hell, I had to do a progressive growth of the the family tree because I didn't want to give things away. This one, I think it's going to be one and done, and we'll just keep the PDF in the, the show notes for you as needed. But the place names to be aware of are Hartfield is Emma's home. That's the Woodhouse home. And it's Hart, H-A-R-T, like a deer, not Hart, H-E-A-R-T, like you hot. So Hartfield is Emma's home. Mr. Knightley is a neighbor about a mile away at Donwell Abbey. Mr. Weston is who Miss Taylor marries. His estate is called Randall's, and it's about a half a mile away. And then you're going to hear about the Churchill family. And the Churchill family is from Yorkshire, so quite a ways away. And the home, uh, the estate for that family is Enscombe or Enscombe. British listeners, Enscombe, E-N-S-C-O-M-B-E, or Enscombe. And then there's the uh, London Knightleys, Mr. Knightley's younger brother married Emma's older sister, and they live in London which we're told is 16 miles away. Okay, words to listen for. Must. Anytime you hear the narrator using the word must, as in, well, she must be pleasant. She must be rich. She must be kind. Um, That's some of that free indirect speech. That's the narrator kind of fading inside the head of the the character in question, and letting you hear how that character thinks. So this puts us into an interesting situation because we've had unreliable narrators before. We now have a semi-unreliable narrator, but we definitely have everybody's, at some point, not quite everybody, but most people's, individual points of view which means they're going to be having individual commentary about the other people who the narrator has introduced us to in a kind of a dispassionate way. We start getting the little detaily bits that I was talking about, the little tweaks to somebody's original frame, frame of reference or framework, character framework. Uh, We get those little tweaks from a lot of these inside the head commentary bits. They're still written in third person. It's beautifully tricky writing. It's just graceful because we don't notice it happening until you start to look at the word must. So keep your ears open. There's always some hidden insight that's useful whenever whenever that word comes in. Alloy, like a metal alloy, alloy, like bronze is an alloy of tin and copper and bronze is stronger. But It is no longer a pure, I'm using air quotes, a pure metal, pure tin or pure copper. So sometimes alloys could make things less precious. Like if you mix gold with anything that's related to copper, that can start to tarnish because of the the copper in it. And so that kind of weakens the value, weakens the, the strength, air quotes again, of the original. There is a usage of the word alloy that's metaphorical, that Emma's opening description is within the world of Emma love and Emma lore, just about as 
famous as the opening of Pride and Prejudice. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. And then at the bottom of the page, the real evils of deed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments, that threatened to weaken or lessen her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes with her. So she is handsome. She's not pretty. She's not beautiful. The narrator very specifically clocks her as handsome. She is clever, which is not always a good thing for women to be. And she is rich. She is the definition of privilege. And the alloy part is, and that definition of privilege comes with it in our modern usage of the word privilege, kind of definitionally. You don't see just how privileged you are, Emma. And there's not a whole lot of reason for anybody to call her out on it because she, she does like doing nice things for people. We will learn about something her father does for his, um, his horseman who drives his carriage and, and takes care of the horse and tackle and everything. Mr. Woodhouse does a lovely thing for him and cares very much about the people around him. Emma's the same way. She clearly gets it from her dad. But the problem with that is when their way of being kind is the only way in their eyes to be kind. So you will see uh, Mr. Woodhouse, kind of like Mr. Fairley in The Woman in White. He's described as a valetudinarian. I had never heard this word before. Uh, valetudo is Latin for health, and a val valetudinarian is somebody who is habitually sick by habit. It's, it's not Munchausen's. It's not hypochondria. It is, I'm just unwell. And that's simply how I am am kind of thing. So where you see him kind of pushing his idea of good onto other people, pay attention to how he behaves with food and what he tries to feed his guests. He is just a piece of work. I mean, he's lovely and charming, but wow. <laughs> uh, you'll hear them playing backgammon. Backgammon's actually been around for about 5,000 years. But the earliest usage of the word backgammon in the English language, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, was 1645. So the game had really only been in, uh, in common play for a little over 100 years. It's not like chess or checkers. It was also, although I've never played it this way, it's a game that you can gamble with. And so, you know, playing for penny and half penny stakes, you could have a fun night playing backgammon. In chapter two, part of Mr. Weston's backstory, Mr. Weston being the man who's going to marry or who has just married Miss Taylor, Emma's governess, who, who truly raised her and is now friends with her. Mr. Weston used to be Captain Weston, part of the local militia. So he didn't, he wasn't part of the army. He was part of the local militia and the militia could be embodied and that means mobilized at any given notice so if they needed to have more trained people over in france fighting napoleon they could activate the militia or more likely if something was happening on their shores or in their area that needed some kind of military presence certainly when you were having riots up in the the mills and the factories when there were protests and several riots at the time, these are the people who would have been called in to help. So he was a captain. He is no longer referred to as captain. He was embodied, which means he was mobilized. And he had a first wife, Miss Churchill. I have been very confused. I really had to actually sit down and parse this. 
you will hear about Mr. Weston marrying Miss Churchill and Miss Churchill's brother and wife not approving of the match. Brother and wife from that point on are referred to as Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, not her parents, not the mother in law and father in law of Mr. Weston. When we hear Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, we are talking about brother and sister-in-law, not mother and father-in-law. It becomes very important. It gets lost in today's chapters, I, I think. Throwing somebody off would be tantamount to disowning them. Portionless means you have no dowry. Apothecaries. Of the three surgeons, doctors, and apothecaries, the apothecaries were lowest on the totem pole. They weren't actually licensed until 1815, until the year that this, this book came out. Surgeons and doctors had to have some kind of, well, had to, in <laughs> talk about air quotes, had to have some kind of medical training in their background to be able to call themselves a surgeon or a doctor. Apothecaries didn't. So they're not quacks. I mean, they definitely know their stuff, but they're they're not going to bleed you. They're not, they're not going to wield a knife or anything like that upon you. There's a card game called, called Quadrille. When you hear it referred to, you need to know that it's already been out of fashion for about 30 years. That will make sense. So Quadrille, not a Quadrille dance or race, but a card game. There is a ladies' school, Mrs. Goddard's school, that is described as not a seminary or an establishment, which seems like a weird thing to make a note of, like a purposeful note. This school is a boarding school. It is not a seminary. It is not an establishment. That's because, as we know, Jane Austen and her sister went to school twice, once in Oxford, and then that became typhus in Southampton. And then later, they, they went to the woman who, who was French, uh, not. They went to her school, and, and that worked out better. However, the woman who claimed to be French was clearly trying to promote her school as something more than what it was. The advertising that they used to do on these things were, this women's seminary, this young ladies' establishment, and their claims to what they could do with these young girls were mammoth and largely untrue. Mrs. Goddard School does exactly what it says it's going to do. It will produce young girls who know how to behave in society, who have skills, and that's great. That's great. They're going to be fine. Fine. Parlor boarder, P A R L O R, a parlor boarder at a school like that would be somebody who's gone through all of the classes that could be offered, but for some reason they're still living there, like their family is traveling and they, they just need to stay on there. And then they basically can sit in the parlor and honestly, kind of be advertising for the school. Because if you come to visit the school to see if it's going to be good for your daughter, you meet the the parlor boarders who, who are there and showing you how the school did with them. Chillblains. Don't hear about chillblains very often anymore. They're sores from, it's not quite frostbite, but it's when your skin gets really, really cold and you wind up with, with sores. Fancy work, needlework, and prosings, P-R-O-S-I-N-G-S. Prosings are tedious speech. The last thing to listen for is Harriet will be described as a natural daughter of somebody. Now, way back when we were living in Tucson, I remember the whole natural child thing coming up, and it, it means that somebody was born out of wedlock. This, 
has a gloss on it that I don't remember coming across before. But being a natural daughter of somebody, capital S, means that you are in this situation at this school because somebody had us enough money, somebody related to you or who cares about you has enough money to board you at the school. And in the case of Harriet, she has now become a parlor boarder, which means that person is still paying for her to be there. So she is an unclaimed child, but the school has an agreement and an account with somebody who's got money. It had to be the weirdest thing ever. You have no idea who your parents are, but there's someone you're related to who just hasn't bothered to come around and claim you yet? I don't know. It seems really uncomfortable to me, but Harriet bears it very well. All right. I think those are all the things that you will need before we listen. So here we go with the first three chapters of Emma by Jane Austen. If you are listening to your own version of the book, you can fast wind ahead to one hour, 20 minutes and 22 seconds. All right, here we go. Chapter one. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly twenty-one years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses, and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess, who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Sixteen years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend, very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. Between them it was more the intimacy of sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint, and the shadow of authority being now long passed away, they had been living together as friend and friend, very mutually attached, and Emma doing just what she liked, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. The real evils, indeed, of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way, and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived, that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes with her. Sorrow came, a gentle sorrow, but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. Miss Taylor married. It was Miss Taylor's loss which first brought grief. It was on the wedding-day of this beloved friend that Emma first sat in mournful thought of any continuance. The wedding over and the bride-people gone, her father and herself were left to dine together, with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner as usual, and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptionable character, easy fortune, suitable age, and pleasant manners, and there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. But it was a black morning's work for her. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. She recalled her past kindness— the kindness, the affection of sixteen years, how she had taught and how she had played with her from five years old, how she had devoted all her powers to attach and amuse her in health, and how nursed her through the various illnesses of childhood. A large debt of gratitude was owing her, but the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve which had soon followed Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other— was yet a dearer, tenderer recollection. She had been a friend and companion such as few possessed, intelligent, well-informed, useful, gentle, knowing all the ways of the family, 
interested in all its concerns, and peculiarly interested in herself, in every pleasure, every scheme of hers, one to whom she could speak every thought as it arose, and who had such an affection for her as could never find fault. How was she to bear the change? It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Mrs. Weston only half a mile from them, and a Miss Taylor in the house. And with all her advantages, natural and domestic, she was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. She dearly loved her father, but he was no companion for her. He could not meet her in conversation, rational or playful. The evil of the actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, was much increased by his constitution and habits, for having been a valetudinarian all his life, without activity of mind or body, he was a much older man in ways than in years, and though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. Her sister, though comparatively but little removed by matrimony, being settled in London only sixteen miles off, was much beyond her daily reach, and many a long October and November evening must be struggled through at Hartfield, before Christmas brought the next visit from Isabella and her husband and their little children, to fill the house and give her pleasant society again. Highbury, the large and populous village almost amounting to a town, to which Hartfield, in spite of its separate lawn and shrubberies and name, did really belong, afforded her no equals. The Woodhouses were first in consequence there. All looked up to them. She had many acquaintance in the place, for her father was universally civil, but not one among them who could be accepted in lieu of Miss Taylor for even half a day. It was a melancholy change— and Emma could not but sigh over it, and wish for impossible things, till her father awoke and made it necessary to be cheerful. His spirits required support. He was a nervous man, easily depressed, fond of everybody that he was used to, and hating to part with them, hating change of every kind. Matrimony, as the origin of change, was always disagreeable, and he was by no means yet reconciled to his own daughter's marrying, nor could ever speak of her but with compassion, though it had been entirely a match of affection, when he was now obliged to part with Miss Taylor, too. And from his habits of gentle selfishness, and of being never able to suppose that other people could feel differently from himself, he was very much disposed to think Miss Taylor had done as sad a thing for herself as for them, and would have been a great deal happier if she had spent all the rest of her life at Hartfield. Emma smiled and chatted as cheerfully as she could, to keep him from such thoughts. But when tea came, it was impossible for him not to say exactly as he had at dinner, "'Poor Miss Taylor! I wish she were here again. What a pity it is that Mr. West never thought of her!" "'I cannot agree with you, papa. You know I cannot. Mr. Weston is such a good-humoured, pleasant, excellent man, that he thoroughly deserves a good wife. And you would not have had Miss Taylor live with us for ever, and bear all my odd humours, when she might have a house of her own.' "'A house of her own? But where is the advantage of a house of her own? This is three times as large. And you never have any odd humours, my dear. How often we shall be going to see them, and they coming to see us! We shall be always meeting. We must begin. We must go and pay wedding visit very soon. My dear, how am I to get so far? Randall's is such a distance. I could not walk half so far. No, papa, nobody thought of your walking. We must go in the carriage, to be sure. The carriage? But James will not like to put the horses to for such a little way. And where are the poor horses to be while we are paying our visit? They are to be put into Mr. Weston's stable, papa. You know we have settled all that already. We talked it all over with Mr. Weston last night. And as for James— you may be very sure he will always like going to Randall's, because of his daughter's being housemaid there. I only doubt whether he will ever take us anywhere else. That was your doing, papa. You got Hannah that good place. Nobody thought of Hannah till you mentioned her. James is so obliged to you. I am very glad I did think of her. It was very lucky, for I would not have had poor James think himself slighted upon any account, 
and I am sure she will make a very good servant. She is a civil, pretty-spoken girl. I have a great opinion of her. Whenever I see her, she always curtsies and asks me how I do in a very pretty manner. And when you have had her here to do needlework, I observe she always turns the lock of the door the right way, and never bangs it. I am sure she will be an excellent servant, and it will be a great comfort to poor Miss Taylor to have somebody about her that she is used to see. Whenever James goes over to see his daughter, you know, she will be hearing of us. He will be able to tell her how we all are." Emma spared no exertions to maintain this happier flow of ideas, and hoped, by the help of backgammon, to get her father tolerably through the evening, and be attacked by no regrets but her own. The backgammon table was placed, but a visitor immediately afterwards walked in and made it unnecessary. Mr. Knightley, a sensible man about seven or eight-and-thirty, was not only a very old and intimate friend of the family, but particularly connected with it, as the elder brother of Isabella's husband. He lived about a mile from Highbury, was a frequent visitor, and always welcome, and at this time more welcome than usual, as coming directly from their mutual connections in London. He had returned to a late dinner after some day's absence, and now walked up to Hartfield to say that they were all well in Brunswick Square. It was a happy circumstance, and animated Mr. Woodhouse for some time. Mr. Knightley had a cheerful manner, which always did him good, and his many inquiries after— poor Isabella and her children were answered most satisfactorily. When this was over, Mr. Woodhouse gratefully observed, "'It is very kind of you, Mr. Knightley, to come out at this late hour to call upon us. I am afraid you must have had a shocking walk.' "'Not at all, sir. It is a beautiful moonlit night, and so mild that I must draw back from your great fire.' "'But you must have found it very damp and dirty. I wish you may not catch cold.' "'Dirty, sir?' Look at my shoes, not a speck on them. Well, that is quite surprising, for we have had a vast deal of rain here. It rained dreadfully hard for half an hour while we were at breakfast. I wanted them to put off the wedding. By the by, I have not wished you joy. Being pretty well aware of what sort of joy you must both be feeling, I have been in no hurry with my congratulations. But I hope it all went off tolerably well. How did you all behave? Who cried most? Oh, poor Miss Taylor! "'Tis a sad business. "'Poor Mr. and Miss Woodhouse, if you please, "'but I cannot possibly say, poor Miss Taylor. "'I have a great regard for you and Emma, "'but when it comes to the question of dependence or independence, "'at any rate, it must be better to have only one to please than two. "'Especially when one of those two is such a fanciful, troublesome creature,' "'said Emma playfully.' That is what you have in your head, I know, and what you would certainly say if my father were not by. "'I believe it is very true, my dear, indeed,' said Mr. Woodhouse, with a sigh. "'I am afraid I am sometimes very fanciful and troublesome.' "'My dearest papa, you do not think I could mean you, or suppose Mr. Knightley to mean you. What a horrible idea! Oh, no, I meant only myself.' Mr. Knightley loves to find fault with me, you know. In a joke, it is all a joke. We always say what we like to one another. Mr. Knightley, in fact, was one of the few people who could see faults in Emma Woodhouse, and the only one who ever told her of them, and though this was not particularly agreeable to Emma herself, she knew it would be so much less to her father that she would not have him really suspect such a circumstance as her being not thought perfect by everybody." "'Emma knows I never flatter her,' said Mr. Knightley. "'But I meant no reflection on anybody. Miss Taylor has been used to have two persons to please. She will now have but one. The chances are that she must be a gainer.' "'Well,' said Emma, willing to let it pass, "'you want to hear about the wedding, and I shall be happy to tell you, for we all behaved charmingly. Everybody was punctual, everybody in their best looks, not a tear and hardly a long face to be seen.' Oh, no! We all felt that we were going to be only half a mile apart, and were sure of meeting every day. "'Dear Emma bears everything so well,' said her father. "'But, Mr. Knightley, she is really very sorry to lose poor Miss Taylor, and I am sure she will miss her more than she thinks for.' Emma turned away her head, divided between tears and smiles. 
"'It is impossible that Emma should not miss such a companion,' said Mr. Knightley. "'We should not like her so well as we do, sir, if we could suppose it. But she knows how much the marriage is to Miss Taylor's advantage. She knows how very acceptable it must be, at Miss Taylor's time of life, to be settled in a home of her own, and how important to her to be secure of a comfortable provision, and therefore cannot allow herself to feel so much pain as pleasure. Every friend of Miss Taylor must be glad to have her so happily married.' "'And you have forgotten one matter of joy to me,' said Emma, "'and a very considerable one, that I made the match myself. I made the match, you know, four years ago, and to have it take place, and be proved in the right, when so many people said Mr. Weston would never marry again, may comfort me for anything.' Mr. Knightley shook his head at her. Her father fondly replied, "'Ah, oh, my dear, I wish you would not make matches and foretell things, for whatever you say always comes to pass. Pray do not make any more matches.' "'I promise you to make none for myself, papa. But I must indeed for other people. It is the greatest amusement in the world. And after such success, you know. Everybody said that Mr. Weston would never marry again. Oh, dear, no! Mr. Weston, who had been a widower so long, and who seemed so perfectly comfortable without a wife, so constantly occupied either in his business in town or among his friends here, always acceptable wherever he went, always cheerful. Mr. Weston need not spend a single evening in the year alone if he did not like it. Oh, no! Mr. Weston certainly would never marry again. Some people even talked of a promise to his wife on her deathbed, and others of the son and the uncle not letting him. All manner of solemn nonsense was talked on the subject, but I believe none of it. Ever since the day, about four years ago, that Miss Taylor and I met with him in Broadway Lane, when, because it began to drizzle, he darted away with so much gallantry and borrowed two umbrellas for us from Farmer Mitchell's, I made up my mind on the subject. I planned the match from that hour— and when such success has blessed me in this instance, dear papa, you cannot think that I shall leave off matchmaking. "'I do not understand what you mean by success,' said Mr. Knightley. "'Success supposes endeavour. Your time has been properly and delicately spent, if you have been endeavouring for the last four years to bring about this marriage. A worthy employment for a young lady's mind.' But if, which I rather imagine your making the match, as you call it, means only your planning it, your saying to yourself one idle day, I think it would be a very good thing for Miss Taylor if Mr. Weston were to marry her, and saying it again to yourself every now and then afterwards, why do you talk of success? Where is your merit? What are you proud of? You made a lucky guess, and that is all that can be said. And have you never known the pleasure and triumph of a lucky guess? I pity you— I thought you cleverer, for depend upon it a lucky guess is never merely luck. There is always some talent in it. And as to my poor word, success, which you quarrel with, I do not know that I am so entirely without any claim to it. You have drawn two pretty pictures, but I think there may be a third, a something between the do-nothing and the do-all. If I had not promoted Mr. Weston's visits here, and given many little encouragements, and smoothed many little matters, it might not have come to anything after all. I think you must know Hartfield enough to comprehend that. A straightforward, open-hearted man like Weston, and a rational, unaffected woman like Miss Taylor, may be safely left to manage their own concerns. You are more likely to have done harm to yourself than good to them by interference." "'Emma never thinks of herself if she can do good to others,' rejoined Mr. Woodhouse, understanding but in part. "'But, my dear, pray do not make any more matches. They are silly things, and break up one's family circle grievously.' "'Only one more, papa, only for Mr. Elton. Poor Mr. Elton! You like Mr. Elton, papa. I must look about for a wife for him. There is nobody in Highbury who deserves him— and he has been here a whole year, and has fitted up his house so comfortably, that it would be a shame to have him single any longer. And I thought, when he was joining their hands to-day, he looked so very much as if he would like to have the same kind office done for him. I think very well of Mr. Elton, and this is the only way I have of doing him a service. Mr. Elton is a very pretty young man, to be sure, and a very good young man, and I have a great regard for him— but if you want to show him any attention, my dear, 
"'Ask him to come and dine with us some day. "'That'll be a much better thing. "'I dare say Mr. Knightley will be so kind as to meet him.' "'With a great deal of pleasure, sir, at any time,' said Mr. Knightley, laughing. "'And I agree with you entirely that it will be a much better thing. "'Invite him to dinner, Emma, and help him to the best of the fish and the chicken, "'but leave him to choose his own wife. "'Depend upon it, a man of six or seven and twenty can take care of himself.' End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Mr. Weston was a native of Highbury, and born of a respectable family, which for the last two or three generations had been rising into gentility and property. He had received a good education, but on succeeding early in life to a small independence, had become indisposed for any of the more homely pursuits in which his brothers were engaged, and had satisfied an active, cheerful mind and social temper by entering into the militia of his county then embodied. Captain Weston was a general favourite, and when the chances of his military life had introduced him to Miss Churchill, of a great Yorkshire family, and Miss Churchill fell in love with him, nobody was surprised, except her brother and his wife, who had never seen him, and who were full of pride and importance, which the connection would offend. Miss Churchill, however, being of age, and with the full command of her fortune, though her fortune bore no proportion to the family estate, was not to be dissuaded from the marriage, and it took place, to the infinite mortification of Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, who threw her off with due decorum. It was an unsuitable connection, and did not produce much happiness. Mrs. Weston ought to have found more in it, for she had a husband whose warm heart and sweet temper made him think everything due to her in return for the great goodness of being in love with him, but though she had one sort of spirit, she had not the best. She had resolution enough to pursue her own will in spite of her brother, but not enough to refrain from unreasonable regrets at that brother's unreasonable anger, nor from missing the luxuries of her former home. They had lived beyond their income, but still it was nothing in comparison of Enscombe. She did not cease to love her husband, but she wanted at once to be the wife of Captain Weston and Miss Churchill of Enscombe. Captain Weston, who had been considered especially by the Churchills as making such an amazing match, was proved to have much the worst of the bargain, for when his wife died, after a three years' marriage, he was rather a poorer man than at first, and with a child to maintain. From the expense of the child, however, he was soon relieved. The boy had, with the additional softening claim of a lingering illness of his mother's, been the means of a sort of reconciliation, and Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, having no children of their own, nor any other young creature of equal kindred to care for, offered to take the whole charge of the little Frank soon after her decease. Some scruples and some reluctance the widower father may be supposed to have felt, but as they were overcome by other considerations, the child was given up to the care and the wealth of the Churchills, and he had only his own comfort to seek, and his own situation to improve as he could. A complete change of life became desirable. He quitted the militia and engaged in trade, having brothers already established in a good way in London, which afforded him a favourable opening. It was a concern which brought just employment enough— he had still a small house in Highbury, where most of his leisure days were spent, and between useful occupation and the pleasures of society, the next eighteen or twenty years of his life passed cheerfully away. He had by that time realized an easy competence, enough to secure the purchase of a little estate adjoining Highbury, which he had always longed for, enough to marry a woman as portionless even as Miss Taylor, and to live according to the wishes of his own friendly and social disposition. It was now some time since Miss Taylor had begun to influence his schemes, but as it was not the tyrannic influence of youth on youth, it had not shaken his determination of never settling till he could purchase Randall's, and the sale of Randall's was long looked forward to. But he had gone steadily on, with these objects in view, till they were accomplished. He had made his fortune, bought his house, and obtained his wife, and was beginning a new period of existence with every probability of greater happiness than in any yet passed through. He had never been an unhappy man, his own temper had secured him from that even in his first marriage, but his second must show him how delightful a well-judging and truly amiable woman could be, and must give him the pleasantest proof of its being a great deal better to choose than to be chosen, to excite gratitude than to feel it. 
He had only himself to please in his choice. His fortune was his own. For as to Frank, it was more than being tacitly brought up as his uncle's heir, it had become so avowed an adoption as to have him assume the name of Churchill on coming of age. It was most unlikely, therefore, that he should ever want his father's assistance. His father had no apprehension of it. The aunt was a capricious woman, and governed her husband entirely, but it was not in Mr. Weston's nature to imagine that any caprice could be strong enough to affect one so dear, and as he believed, so deservedly dear. He saw his son every year in London, and was proud of him, and his fond report of him as a very fine young man had made Highbury feel a sort of pride in him too. He was looked on as sufficiently belonging to the place to make his merits and prospects a kind of common concern. Mr. Frank Churchill was one of the boasts of Highbury, and a lively curiosity to see him prevailed, though the compliment was so little returned that he had never been there in his life. His coming to visit his father had been often talked of, but never achieved. Now, upon his father's marriage, it was very generally proposed, as a most proper attention, that the visit should take place. There was not a dissentient voice on the subject, either when Mrs. Perry drank tea with Mrs. and Miss Bates, or when Mrs. and Miss Bates returned the visit. Now was the time for Mr. Frank Churchill to come among them, and the hope strengthened when it was understood that he had written to his new mother on the occasion. For a few days, every morning visit in Highbury included some mention of the handsome letter Mrs. Weston had received. "'I suppose you have heard of the handsome letter Mr. Frank Churchill has written to Mrs. Weston. I understand it was a very handsome letter indeed. Mr. Woodhouse told me of it. Mr. Woodhouse saw the letter, and he says he never saw such a handsome letter in his life.' It was indeed a highly prized letter. Mrs. Weston had, of course, formed a very favourable idea of the young man, and such a pleasing attention was an irresistible proof of his great good sense, and a most welcome addition to every source and every expression of congratulation which her marriage had already secured. She felt herself a most fortunate woman, and she had lived long enough to know how fortunate she might be well thought, where the only regret was for a partial separation from friends, whose friendship for her had never cooled, and who could ill bear to part from her. She knew that at times she must be missed, and could not think without pain of Emma's losing a single pleasure, or suffering an hour's ennui, from the want of her companionableness. But dear Emma was of no feeble character. She was more equal to her situation than most girls would have been, and had sense and energy and spirits that might be hoped would bear her well and happily, through its little difficulties and privations. And then there was such comfort in the very easy distance of Randalls from Hartfield, so convenient for even solitary female walking, and in Mr. Weston's disposition and circumstances, which would make the approaching season no hindrance to their spending half the evenings in the week together. Her situation was altogether the subject of hours of gratitude to Mrs. Weston, and of moments only of regret, and her satisfaction— her more than satisfaction, her cheerful enjoyment was so just and so apparent, that Emma, well as she knew her father, was sometimes taken by surprise at his being able to still pity poor Miss Taylor when they left her at Randall's in the centre of every domestic comfort, or saw her go away in the evening attended by her pleasant husband to a carriage of her own. But never did she go without Mr. Woodhouse's giving a gentle sigh, and saying, "'Ah, oh, poor Miss Taylor!' she would be very glad to stay. There was no recovering Miss Taylor, nor much likelihood of ceasing to pity her, but a few weeks brought some alleviation to Mr. Woodhouse. The compliments of his neighbours were over, he was no longer teased by being wished joy of so sorrowful an event, and the wedding-cake, which had been a great distress to him, was all at up. His own stomach could bear nothing rich, and he could never believe other people to be different from himself— what was unwholesome to him he regarded as unfit for anybody, and he had, therefore, earnestly tried to dissuade them from having any wedding-cake at all, and when that proved vain, as earnestly tried to prevent anybody's eating it. He had been at the pains of consulting Mr. Perry, the apothecary, on the subject. Mr. Perry was an intelligent, gentlemanlike man, whose frequent visits were one of the comforts of Mr. Woodhouse's life, and upon being applied to, he could not but acknowledge— though it seemed rather against the bias of inclination, that wedding-cake might certainly disagree with many, perhaps with most people, unless taken moderately. With such an opinion in confirmation of his own, Mr. Woodhouse hoped to influence every visitor of the newly married pair, 
But still the cake was eaten, and there was no rest for his benevolent nerves till it was all gone. There was a strange rumour in Highbury of all the little Perrys being seen with a slice of Mrs. Weston's wedding cake in their hands, but Mr. Woodhouse would never believe it. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Mr. Woodhouse was fond of society in his own way. He liked very much to have his friends come and see him, and from various united causes, from his long residence at Hartfield and his good nature, from his fortune, his house, and his daughter, he could command the visits of his own little circle in a great measure as he liked. He had not much intercourse with any families beyond that circle. His horror of late hours and large dinner-parties made him unfit for any acquaintance but such as would visit him on his own terms. Fortunately for him, Highbury, including Randalls in the same parish, and Donwell Abbey in the parish adjoining, the seat of Mr. Knightley, comprehended many such. Not unfrequently, through Emma's persuasion, he had some of the chosen and the best to dine with him, but evening parties were what he preferred— and unless he fancied himself at any time unequal to company, there was scarcely an evening in the week in which Emma could not make up a card-table for him. Real, long-standing regard brought the Westons and Mr. Knightley, and by Mr. Elton, a young man living alone without liking it, the privilege of exchanging any vacant evening of his own blank solitude for the elegancies and society of Mr. Woodhouse's drawing-room and the smiles of his lovely daughter was in no danger of being thrown away. After these came a second set, among the most come at table of whom were Mrs. and Miss Bates, and Mrs. Goddard, three ladies almost always at the service of an invitation from Hartfield, and who were fetched and carried home so often that Mr. Woodhouse thought it no hardship for either James or the horses. Had it taken place only once a year, it would have been a grievance. Mrs. Bates, the widow of a former vicar of Highbury, was a very old lady almost past everything but tea and quadrille. She lived with her single daughter in a very small way, and was considered with all the regard and respect which a harmless old lady, under such untoward circumstances, can excite. Her daughter enjoyed a most uncommon degree of popularity, for a woman neither young, handsome, rich, nor married. Miss Bates stood in the very worst predicament in the world for having much of the public favour, and she had no intellectual superiority to make atonement to herself, or frighten those who might hate her into outward respect. She had never boasted either beauty or cleverness. Her youth had passed without distinction, and her middle of life was devoted to the care of a failing mother, and the endeavour to make a small income go as far as possible. And yet she was a happy woman, and a woman whom no one named without good will. It was her own universal goodwill and contented temper which worked such wonders. She loved everybody, was interested in everybody's happiness, quick-sighted to everybody's merits, thought herself a most fortunate creature, and surrounded with blessings in such an excellent mother, and so many good neighbours and friends, and a home that wanted for nothing. The simplicity and cheerfulness of her nature, her contented and grateful spirit, were a recommendation to everybody, and a mine of felicity to herself. She was a great talker upon little matters, which exactly suited Mr. Woodhouse, full of trivial communications and harmless gossip. Mrs. Goddard was the mistress of a school, not of a seminary or an establishment or anything which professed in long sentences of refined nonsense to combine liberal acquirements with elegant morality, upon new principles and new systems, and where young ladies for enormous pay might be screwed out of health and into vanity— but a real, honest, old-fashioned boarding-school, where a reasonable quantity of accomplishments were sold at a reasonable price, and where girls might be sent to be out of the way, and scramble themselves into a little education, without any danger of coming back prodigies. Mrs. Goddard's school was in high repute, and very deservedly, for Highbury was reckoned a particularly healthy spot— she had an ample house and garden, gave the children plenty of wholesome food, let them run about a good deal in the summer, and in winter dressed their chilblains with her own hands. It was no wonder that a train of twenty young couple now walked after her to church. She was a plain, motherly kind of woman, who had worked hard in her youth, and now thought herself entitled to the occasional holiday of a tea-visit, and having formerly owed much to Mr. Woodhouse's kindness, felt his particular claim on her to leave her neat parlour, hung round with fancy-work whenever she could, and win or lose a few sixpences by his fireside. 
These were the ladies whom Emma found herself very frequently able to collect, and happy was she, for her father's sake, in the power, though as far as she herself was concerned it was no remedy for the absence of Mrs. Weston. She was delighted to see her father look comfortable, and very much pleased with herself for contriving things so well. But the quiet prosings of three such women made her feel that every evening so spent was indeed one of the long evenings she had fearfully anticipated. As she sat one morning, looking forward to exactly such a close of the present day, a note was brought from Mrs. Goddard, requesting, in most respectful terms, to be allowed to bring Miss Smith with her. A most welcome request! For Miss Smith was a girl of seventeen, whom Emma knew very well by sight, and had long felt an interest in, on account of her beauty. A very gracious invitation was returned, and the evening no longer dreaded by the fair mistress of the mansion. Harriet Smith was the natural daughter of somebody. Somebody had placed her several years back at Mrs. Goddard's school, and somebody had lately raised her from the condition of scholar to that of parlour boarder. This was all that was generally known of her history. She had no visible friends but what had been acquired at Highbury, and was just now returned from a long visit in the country to some young ladies who had been at school there with her. She was a very pretty girl, and her beauty happened to be of a sort which Emma particularly admired. She was short, plump, and fair, with a fine bloom, blue eyes, light hair, regular features, and a look of great sweetness, and before the end of the evening Emma was as much pleased with her manners as her person, and quite determined to continue the acquaintance. She was not struck by anything remarkably clever in Miss Smith's conversation, but she found her altogether very engaging not inconveniently shy, not unwilling to talk, and yet so far from pushing, showing so proper and becoming a deference, seeming so pleasantly grateful for being admitted to Hartfield, and so artlessly impressed by the appearance of everything in so superior a style to what she had been used to, that she must have good sense and deserve encouragement. Encouragement should be given. Those soft blue eyes and all those natural graces should not be wasted on the inferior society of Highbury and its connections. The acquaintance she had already formed were unworthy of her. The friends from whom she had just parted, though a very good sort of people, must be doing her harm. They were a family of the name of Martin, whom Emma knew well by character, as renting a large farm of Mr. Knightley, and residing in the parish of Donwell very creditably, she believed. She knew Mr. Knightley thought highly of them, but they must be coarse and unpolished, and very unfit to be the intimates of a girl who wanted only a little more knowledge and elegance to be quite perfect. She would notice her, she would improve her, she would detach her from her bad acquaintance, and introduce her into good society, she would form her opinions and her manners. It would be an interesting, and certainly a very kind undertaking, highly becoming her own situation in life, her leisure and powers. She was so busy in admiring those soft blue eyes, in talking and listening and forming all these schemes in the in-betweens, that the evening flew away at a very unusual rate, and the supper-table, which always closed such parties, and for which she had been used to sit and watch the due time, was all set out and ready, and moved forwards to the fire, before she was aware— with an alacrity beyond the common impulse of a spirit which yet was never indifferent to the credit of doing everything well and attentively, with the real good will of a mind delighted with his own ideas, did she then do all the honours of the meal, and help and recommend the minced chicken and scalloped oysters, with an urgency which she knew would be acceptable to the early hours and civil scruples of their guests. Upon such occasions poor Mr. Woodhouse's feelings were in sad warfare— he loved to have the cloth laid, because it had been the fashion of his youth, but his conviction of suppers being very unwholesome made him rather sorry to see anything put on it, and while his hospitality would have welcomed his visitors to everything, his care for their health made him grieve that they would eat. Such another small basin of thin gruel as his own was all that he could, with thorough self-approbation, recommend, though he might constrain himself, while the ladies were comfortably clearing the nicer things, to say— "'Mrs. Bates, let me propose your venturing on one of these eggs. An egg boiled very soft is not unwholesome. Searle understands boiling an egg better than anybody. I would not recommend an egg boiled by anybody else. But you need not be afraid. They are very small, you see. One of our small eggs will not hurt you. Miss Bates, let Emma help you to a little bit of tart, a very little bit.' 
ours are all apple tarts. You need not be afraid of unwholesome preserves here. I do not advise the custard. Mrs. Goddard, what say you to half a glass of wine? A small half glass put into a tumbler of water. I do not think it could disagree with you. Emma allowed her father to talk, but supplied her visitors in a much more satisfactory style, and on the present evening had particular pleasure in sending them away happy. The happiness of Miss Smith was quite equal to her intentions. Miss Woodhouse was so great a personage in Highbury that the prospect of the introduction had given as much panic as pleasure, but the humble, grateful little girl went off with highly gratified feelings, delighted with the affability with which Miss Woodhouse had treated her all the evening, and actually shaken hands with her at last. End of chapter three. All right. So, if you're watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed watching the wonky log cabin quilt thing. Actually, I'm going to show you, I, I made another wonky log cabin quilt piece, and I have used it as the book cover for my annotated Emma. I wanted something that I that could hold up, because this is a heavy book, and bashing it around was not going to be fun. But I also needed something that I could put substantial pockets in for notes and things. And so I used an old pair of Aiden's jeans, and I log cabin to the front. So wonky log cabins. I'm going to go back to the first chapter and go through my notes that I took in the book, because I want to make sure that we get all of the little details about these characters before we head out into plot land next week. So one of the things is Mr. Woodhouse did not marry early. Mr. Knightley is the older brother of the husband of Isabella, of Emma's sister. So Mr. Knightley, older, has not married. In this particular environment, not marrying until late is a no thing. Mr. Weston is no spring chicken, and he just got married to Miss Taylor. She's probably 35 or so at this point. But there's lots of marriages happening that are very late for one person, the guy in this story. It's everywhere. One of the pieces of this story that I know a lot of people have trouble with is the fact that Mr. Knightley is so much older than Emma. And I think, I think this context helps explain that somewhat. I mean, Jane Austen wrote it this way on purpose, but I think there's some more things that the age difference aids when it comes to, to telling the story. And we'll get into more of those uh, later. Mr. Woodhouse is also described as being, you know, lovely and fun, but his spirits required support. So even though he's very cheerful, he was a nervous man who was easily depressed, fond of everybody who he was used to and hating to part with them and hated change of every kind. This does not sound like an easy person to get along with. And yet when you're there, and he enjoys his time with you. He's sparkling. He's just quirky, prickly, unique, eccentric. I mentioned at the beginning that Mr. Woodhouse had done something very nice for somebody else, for James the uh, horseman. Mr. Woodhouse thought that his daughter Hannah would make a lovely servant for Randalls, for the Weston family, and that way Miss Taylor would have somebody who she recognized because poor dear. But I loved that the whole thing that recommended Hannah in Papa Woodhouse's mind was that she never banged the door. She didn't open the door loudly. She didn't unlock it loudly. She didn't bang the door loudly. And she curtsied in the most charming way. And that's, you know, that's it. That's high praise. Mr. Knightley, importantly, is 37 or 38, but he is immediately described as a sensible man. And I think we see some beautiful conversating going on between him and Mr. Woodhouse and Emma. He may give her grief, but she gives back. 
she is not cowed by this person. This does not come across to me the way creepy older men, younger women relationships often do, where the younger woman is looking up to the guy with, you know, big eyes, like, oh, you know so much more about the world than I do. Golly, I'll just do whatever you say. That is not Emma. <laughs> not a chance. She believes she knows exactly what everybody else should be doing. And she's had nobody disagree with that except for Mr. Knightley. And sometimes it's good to have somebody who can call you on your stuff. Emma also says to her father, after they do the Emma calling herself a fanciful, troublesome creature, and Mr. Woodhouse is like, oh, nobody would ever say that of you. And Emma's like, it's a joke, Dad. It's a joke. We always joke like this. We, we always say what we like to one another. Mr. Knightley, in fact, was one of the few people who could see faults in Emma Woodhouse and the only one who ever told her of them. Emma knows I never flatter her, says Knightley. This is important. He's sensible. He is not prone to flattery. He is older. He has had more experience in the world. He is very likely an excellent judge of character. So when Knightley says something, there is some insight in it that's worth being noted when he doesn't like someone or something, it's a good thing to note as well. I loved that when Emma claims to have made the match between Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston, she's very proud of herself. I made the match, you know, four years ago. And to have it take place and be proved in the right it's their marriage is proving that I was right. When so many people said Mr. Weston would never marry again, it may comfort me for anything. Mr. Knightley shakes his head, doesn't say anything. Mr. Woodhouse says, oh dear, I wish you would not make matches and foretell things. And I'm thinking that the next words out of his mouth are going to be, because it's really bad to walk around acting like you know what everybody else should do. But no, he says, because whatever you say comes to pass. Meaning, you're changing my world every time you do that. Stop it, please. It is easy to see how Emma became Emma with a, a dad who is that indulgent and Miss Taylor, who was a good friend, but that also means probably not so easy to steer Emma. She's awfully headstrong. The word that gets used here in, in this first chapter that absolutely chilled me that I did not hear the first two times I, I went through the book is her response, Emma's response to the, the pray do not make more matches. I promise you to make none for myself, Papa, but I must indeed for other people. It is the greatest amusement in the world. It is the greatest amusement? You're screwing with people's lives, woman. That, to me, sums up so much about Emma. This is a girl who is too smart for her own good, has nobody to challenge her intellectually except Mr. Knightley, and doesn't think she can make a mistake. This is a bad combination. If this is how she amuses herself just to stop from being bored, it's going to be bad for everyone at some point. But at the same time, Emma is very aware of little kindnesses, little things that people do that are kind, that are generous of spirit. Mr. Watson going and getting umbrellas for her and Miss Taylor when they were walking in the rain. She is always noticing the good things in people. There's a lot of that that goes on in this book as well. I also loved what Mr. Knightley said about I do not understand what you mean by success, success in making this match. Success supposes endeavor. You didn't do a bloody thing. You're claiming that you put this match together, please. 
He says, why do you talk of success? Where is your merit? What are you proud of? You made a lucky guess, and that is all that can be said. Her response is also interesting. She says, you know, if you've never been lucky enough to have a lucky guess, I pity you. There's a lot of joy in that, which is true. But she says, you have drawn two pretty pictures, the endeavoring and the taking credit for something that didn't have anything to do with you. But I think there may be a third, a something between the do nothing and the do all. This finding a third way is something that Emma will do to good effect, but also do as a way of getting herself out of recognizing that what she's done has crossed a line. And that happens various points throughout the book. So that's something just to keep your ear open for. So the Churchills. If you've read the book or watched the movie, you know that Frank Churchill is a character who is very important. Now, at the end of chapter one, Mr. Knightley says, depend upon it, a man of six or seven and 20 can take care of himself. He's talking about Mr. Elton there, but I was like, wait a minute. I know there's Frank Churchill shows up. How old is Frank? Frank's actually 23. So he is younger than the age where Knightley is like, by this age, a guy can take care of himself. It's probably true. 26, 27. So it's complicated. Mr. Weston married Miss Churchill back when he was Captain Weston. It was not a particularly happy match because she wanted to be the lady of the manor where she'd grown up. Her independent fortune, her money that she took with her as a dowry, wasn't enough to give her that lifestyle. So they were living beyond their means, and it wasn't particularly pleasant. But Mr. Weston is a very easygoing person. And so, well, he didn't leave the marriage at all. She she died. But he doesn't seem to hold grudges that way. And he he did have to be talked into handing Frank over to Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, the brother and sister-in-law. Of Mr. Weston in his first marriage. They have money. They have the estate, Enscombe, Enscombe, Enscombe. And having somebody take over the raising of a child like this, I, I mentioned last week, not that odd. Jane Austen's own brother, Edward, he was adopted much older too. He was adopted at the age of 16 and officially changed his name much later. He inherited a massive estate. Oh, in fact, there was a short documentary I saw on accident that took place at his estate where they trained dancers to do the dances, the Regency dances in Regency clothing. I will put a link to that in the show notes because it is amazing. It's way harder than you would think. I knew dancing a minuet hurt your calves. I didn't know just how hurt your calves were going to get with the dances that they knew how to do. And one of the lines that I liked in the thing was the, the host says, okay, everybody makes fun of Mr. Churchill because he's a lousy dancer. I get it now. It, it may have been a blight on his character, but man, plenty of people must have been bad dancers. Anyway, back to Mr. Weston. So he had been in the military. He no longer has to pay for Frank. He gets himself out of debt. He goes into trade. Now, in the last 20 years, I have seen assumptions being made that anytime somebody says that they were in trade or they were in business or they were a merchant, that that was code for they were making their money off of the slave trade. Jane Austen actually brings up the slave trade by name later in Emma. If she had wanted to make that point here, she would have. He was probably, you know, like importing and exporting olive oil, like the Godfather. He was not bad guy raping the planet for his own profit. I also loved that, that her relationship, Miss Taylor's relationship with Mr. Weston, it was not the tyrannic influence of youth on youth. It wasn't Romeo and Juliet. They weren't heartbreakingly 
passionately needing to see each other. And as a consequence, she let him take his time. He let her take her time. And then they got married when they were happy to. Frank Churchill will be Frank Churchill forever. He's never going to be Churchill. He's never going to be Mr. Churchill. Mr. Churchill would be the man who raised him, his uncle. But referring to him just by his last name, like Knightley, would be crossing lines in polite society. And we'll be going more into uh, those rules and expectations because people do cross those lines in this book and it it matters. It's a it's an indicator of a lack of class. How they cross that line is an indicator, and the fact that they cross that line is also an indicator. The thing that's interesting is Frank Churchill has never shown up in Highbury, and yet everybody knows he's being raised by the Churchills at their grand estate. And Mr. Weston is from Highbury, so by transitive property, they all care about Frank Churchill, even though nobody has ever met him. And he didn't even make it to the wedding. So Frank Churchill is interesting. And we will keep hearing about him. It will keep running. I also love that the, the letter that Frank Churchill writes to Miss Weston, basically apologizing for being a schmuck and not showing up to the wedding, was a handsome letter. Like Emma, handsome. It was a handsome letter. We don't know if that means he had lovely handwriting or the sentiments were expressed beautifully, but it was a handsome letter and irresistible proof of his great good sense. Writing a good letter can really do wonders. And then at the end of chapter two, the wedding cake bit. Oh, this is just some bloody beautiful Austin. Mr. Weston clearly wanting the apothecary, Mr. Perry, to agree with him that eating cake, this is not such a good idea. And it was a wedding cakes looked like wedding cakes now. They had layers. They had flour, eggs, sugar, spices, often dried fruit or jellies or jams. Sometimes they were covered in marzipan or some kind of a sugar icing, but they didn't usually have the fiddly bits, the piped on stuff that makes wedding cakes into often ginormous artworks. But I love that Mr. Perry does finally agree that wedding cake might certainly disagree with many, perhaps with most people, unless taken moderately. With such an opinion in confirmation of his own, Mr. Woodhouse hoped to influence every visitor of the new married pair. And then there's a semicolon. And then it says, but still, the cake was eaten. It is a beautiful usage of inactive prose instead of, you know, an action verb, active verbs. This is passive. There was a strange rumor in Highbury of all the little Perrys being seen with a slice, Perry, the apothecary's kids, being seen with a slice of Mrs. Weston's wedding cake in their hands. But Mr. Woodhouse would never believe it. Everything we need to know about Mr. Weston. Chapter three is our Highbury hierarchy. Mr. Woodhouse's first choice of guests to have over would have been the Westons, obviously, and Mr. Knightley and Mr. Elton, who's the, the vicar of the town, unmarried, not happy about being unmarried. So for him, getting to come over to Hartfield is uh, an enormous treat. Then there's the second set of people Mr. Woodhouse likes having over. Jane Austen says, among the most comatable of whom, it seems so modern. After these came a second set, among the most comatable of whom, Mrs. and Miss Bates and Mrs. Goddard. They're easy to get. They're not doing anything. So whenever you want to have them over, they're easy to, to get. They're easy to go, come get come get a bowl. And it's written that way, come hyphen at hyphen able. <laughs> Mrs. Bates, the elder, was married to the former vicar. That did not leave her a whole lot of money to live on when the vicar died. She is living with her daughter, unmarried, Miss Bates. And this is one of the main reasons why 
I really don't want you to think about the actors who have portrayed these characters in the movies. Miss Bates gets played for comedy up until a, a single turning point late in the book. That's fine, but doesn't do her justice. Her humor has an awful lot more to do with goodwill in many places in the book. But there are a couple of pointed comments that Austin gives us about Miss Bates that I think are super important. She enjoyed the most uncommon degree of popularity for a woman neither young, handsome, rich, nor married. She was in the very worst predicament in the world for having so much public favor. She had no intellectual superiority to make atonement to herself or frighten those who might hate her into outward respect. So they don't have any reason to respect her because she's smart. She had never boasted about her beauty or her cleverness. Her youth had passed without distinction. Ouch. And her middle life was devoted to the care of a failing mother and an endeavor to make a small income go as far as possible. And yet, she was a happy woman. And a woman whom no one named without goodwill. Nobody talks about Miss Bates without saying something nice about her. She loved everybody. She was interested in everybody's happiness, not their business, their happiness. Quick-sighted to everybody's merits, she always sees the best in people. Thought herself a most fortunate creature and surrounded with blessings in such an excellent mother and so many good neighbors and friends and a home that wanted for nothing. The simplicity and cheerfulness of her nature, her contented and grateful spirit, were a recommendation to everybody and a mine of felicity to herself. The very last sentence of that long, it's a long paragraph about Miss Bates, she was a great talker of little matters, which exactly suited Mr. Woodhouse, full of trivial communications and harmless gossip. Her speeches are some of the best things I've ever read. I did not expect to feel that way if all I'd seen was the movies. I also thought it, there's an interesting turn of phrase here that sounds so modern, but when you hear the word screw, you need to think of like screwing a bolt into place. That Mrs. Goddard was the mistress of the school, not of a seminary or an establishment or anything which professed in long sentences of refined nonsense to combine liberal acquirements with, with elegant morality upon the new principles and new systems and where young ladies for enormous pay, might be screwed out of health and into vanity. It's not screwed the way we use it, but if you think about it like a peg on a pegboard, you're taking it out of the slot that it should be in, health, and you're screwing it into a new slot, vanity. Vanity, the one thing Emma is not. She's not vain about her looks. She has every reason to be. She is not vain about her looks. This becomes so important in so many places to keep that in mind. I also love that Mrs. Goddard's school was a place where these girls could get themselves into a little education without any danger of coming back prodigies. <laughs> They're not going to solve cancer, but they'll be nice to talk to. All right, Harriet Smith, the natural daughter of somebody, a very pretty girl, pretty not handsome, and her beauty happened to be of a sort which Emma particularly admired. Some literary criticism in, has indicated that that's why we know she's blonde. That's why we know Emma is blonde, is because she admires Harriet's beauty. That would be true if Emma were vain. But I don't think that's what we're hearing here. She's described as short, plump, and fair with a fine bloom blue eyes, light hair, regular features, and a look of great sweetness. That's a great look on anybody. That's lovely. You would be an idiot not to look at somebody like that and go, wow, she's lovely. So for Emma to say, you know, she particularly admires this. Well, we know Emma has hazel eyes and that's it. So this is a look that she likes. In art, she draws. Maybe she likes painting people who look like this. 
I don't know. But I don't think this is a sign that she's supposed to be blonde or was blonde in Jane Austen's mind. Not that it matters that much, but just irksome. The first line of the next paragraph is, she was not, she, Emma, was not struck by anything remarkably clever in Miss Smith's conversation, but she found her altogether very engaging. Now we're going to move into what Emma's thinking. She was not inconveniently shy nor unwilling to talk, and yet so far from pushing, showing so proper and becoming a deference, seeming so pleasantly grateful for being admitted to Hartfield, and so artlessly impressed by the appearance of everything in so superior a style to what she had been used to, that she must have good sense and deserve encouragement. Encouragement should be given. And Within two sentences, Emma is saying, those good looks should not be wasted on the inferior society of Highbury. And the friends that she just stayed with, they must be doing her harm. Even though Emma knows they're a good sort of people, they're tenants of Mr. Knightley. They have, are renting a large farm from Mr. Knightley. And he's only had good things to say about her. But they must be coarse and unpolished and very unfit to be the intimates of a girl who wanted only a little more knowledge and elegance to be quite perfect. A little more knowledge could be who her parents actually are and whether, you know, she comes from money, money, but also a little more knowledge like she's not very worldly. But anybody who comes to your house and praises you and says everything about your home and the way you live is beautiful and marvelous and who agrees with everything you have to say, of course you're going to think this person is awesome. Emma's being suckered, not on purpose. It's not like Harriet is being manipulative, but Emma's suckered into believing her to be a fabulous, fabulous person when in fact she's pretty simple and kind. And by the end of that paragraph, Emma's worked herself up. She would notice Harriet. She would improve her. She would detach her from her bad acquaintances and introduce her into good society. She would form her opinions and her manners. It would be an interesting and certainly a very kind undertaking, highly becoming her own situation in life, her leisure, and her powers. Again, this is what happens when women don't have a job. Bad news. And by the end of the chapter, as Harriet is going home, we get to be inside Harriet's mind for a little bit. Before going, the prospect had given as much panic as pleasure, but the humble, grateful little girl went off with highly gratified feelings, delighted with the affability with which Miss Woodhouse had treated her all evening, and actually shaken hands with her at last. And that is all it takes for Harriet to love Emma. How could you not? If you come from truly nothing and are suddenly thrust into the bell of the ball, wants to be your friend. All right, this was a lot today. I know it was a lot. The next chapters are not so heavy a lift, but it's so important to get so much of that nuance of exposition that we get here at the beginning of this book. Without it, I think it's very easy to go off track with the book and why Jane Austen wrote Emma the way she did. She does say she's written the only character that only she will appreciate. If you like the book, you are hanging with Jane. All right, that is it for me. You take care of yourself. Have a great week. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff.
And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.